So, good afternoon. I think I know most of you. For those of you who do not know me, I am Carolyn Kalari. I'm the executive director of Opus Connect, uh, the New York chapter. Um, Opus Connect, as I think uh, most, if not all of you know, is a lower middle middle market professional organization with members in the financial industry. Our members are comprised of private equity, family offices, independent sponsors, and the professionals that service the industry. We have these monthly events. Um, we, we have chapters in LA, Chicago, and New York. Here in New York, we have monthly events with different formats. Today, we are um, honored to have a, a VIP speaker, just one on um, cybersecurity. Other times we have panels, other times we have roundtable discussions, or we have socials like we did last month. So if you want more information about Opus, um, feel free to reach out to me and let me know. <coughs> Events like this obviously do not happen without our gracious and wonderful sponsors. We really have been blessed with great sponsors who not only provide excellent service, but also have, um, have opened their Rolodex to our members and really get out there to try and help connect you to the people you want to be connected with. So. I encourage you to reach out to our sponsors, but we'll start with our host, um, Ice Miller, Chase. Thank you, Carolyn. I think I know most of the people in the room, but I'm Chase Stewart. If you aren't familiar with Ice Miller, you're in our offices, so you're off to a good start. <laughs> We're a Midwestern-based law firm, over 350 lawyers. In our office, we specialize in transactional work for usually lower middle market and middle market companies. We represent a number of private equity funds, independent sponsors, SDICs, mezzanine funds. So. Happy to make any introductions as well if you're looking for sources of capital, either uh, leverage buyouts or if you're looking for loans, make any introductions you can. Looking forward to meeting everybody today and thanks again for letting us host. Thanks, Chase. Um, many of our other sponsors are not here, so I'll just run through them. Baker Tilly, um, I think you all know accounting firm. BCMS is a self-side advisor. NFP, I don't see our guys from NFP, an insurance broker, but we do have Jerry Buckley, and so now you have more time. There we go. Carolyn said I could take as much time to fill up for the other sponsors, so just there we get go. comfortable. Get that. some coffee. Yeah, you know, it's, and I'm Irish, so I can talk a long time. Uh, so, quick background: uh, Pine Hill's been a sponsor probably six, seven years now. We are now we'll have a name change hopefully by next month to CFGI. CFGI acquired us uh, as of April 1st. Uh, CFGI is a Carlisle portfolio company so now we are a 400 person accounting consulting firm we don't do audits what we do is technical accounting in this space we do a lot of transaction advisory due diligence when uh, and so uh, we've done quality earnings for some of the members of the group and the other thing that we're seeing a lot now is the implementation of the new accounting uh, standards so most private companies portfolio companies have to adopt the new revenue recognition standard we've helped public companies do that we're now helping private companies do that and then the next is the new lease accounting standard. So uh, we also do valuation work. So uh, we're now a 400-person firm. Uh, we look forward to continuing our sponsorship, and I'll, I'll stop there, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, you appreciate your sponsorship and friendship for all of these years, so thank you. And if you're ever in Philly, and I know you have the office here in New York now too, so uh, congratulations on that. Thanks. So I just wanna also, next month is our event is on June 11th and it is tied to our Deal Connect event. And if you are not familiar with our Deal Connect events, uh, we have them throughout the country where we pair together different pairings. It's like speed dating for deals. And so our July, June event is on the 11th and that will be um, investment banking and capital providers. So if you want more information about that, our Deal Connects are run by Terrence Winters, which is uh, here. So feel free to reach out to him on any Deal Connect information. And since Edin is also in the room, Edin is also one of our Opus Connect colleagues, and he can help you also with uh, membership sponsorships and things of that nature. But June 11th is our regular monthly event, but it's tied to our Deal Connect event, which you need to register separately for if you're interested with Terrence, and then that'll be throughout the afternoon after our luncheon event. So um, we welcome you um, for that. Now, with that, we're going to get started, and we are honored and uh, welcome Roy Zer with um, Cybit. And I will not go through his whole background, but I encouraged him to give you a little bit more. It's very impressive. I just know he uh, used to be part of the 8200 of Isra Israeli Defense Forces, which is like the American NSA. Um, he knows all about cybersecurity, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you. So, um, yeah, my background is coming from uh, Israel. Um, I've been served, I served about uh, 
decade, a bit more than in this unit A200, um, been a major in our uh, security, cybersecurity and cyber intelligence department. And today I'm gonna to focus about threats in cybersecurity and how it can be relevant for companies and financial institutions, financial professionals, financial entities in general. And I know it's um, probably a top audience based on, you know, it's not probably the most important thing for you, the day-to-day -day work and uh, maybe not that interesting. So I'll try to make it interesting by focusing on things that in my point of view can be relevant for investors in general, uh, financial entities specifically, M&A processes, because I think that cybersecurity actually applies um, to all of that and not just the uh, regular, you know, don't click the link, don't download the file, don't do the Wi-Fi, things like, that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. Also, I hope it will be new in some aspect, you know, for those of you who heard so many uh, cybersecurity um, lectures before. And I don't know how many of you have been uh, watching Game of Thrones or are watching Game of Thrones, just so I have any indication how many people are aware of Game of Thrones, what it is, okay. So okay, I'm not gonna get into the details of the story, but I'm gonna use Game of Thrones actually as an analogy um, during my presentation to explain um, cybersecurity or to simplify uh, thinking about cybersecurity because I feel like a lot of times when people started to talk about cybersecurity, including myself, it's like, especially with people who are not technological people or that's not their main focus, they're, that's like the, you know, their ears shut and, and nobody really cares and it sounds like blah, blah, bits and bytes. And um, eventually when we think about cybersecurity, if we simplify it, we just go to the basics of what it is, it's not different than any kind of security. Eventually you have this kingdom, okay, you have this uh, this company or entity or whatever, holding company, uh, and in this kingdom of yours, uh, you own the kingdom or you're part of this kingdom and you have a lot of assets in this kingdom. You know, in the past you could have whatever you have in the kingdom, today you have data, customers' data, money, other, uh, other assets. And the question is, how do we protect these assets? Um, and protecting, you know, a lot of times when we think about protection, we think about, okay, walls, you know, let's, let's build walls. I mean, like in the medieval days, you know, just bigger wall. But the problem, and, and this is where I'm starting to give the Game of Thrones example, you know, the problem is, and for those of you who haven't been watching Game of Thrones, I'm not gonna do any spoilers anyway, but um, the, the basic, there's a lot of things in the story, but one of the basic things happening in this TV series is that eventually there's this kind of uh, ongoing war between good and evil, or good and bad, uh, and the bad is being represented by these, what we call white walkers, or these entities coming from the, uh, the north, uh, want to uh, kill everyone and, and make them zombies. Uh, so think about these white walkers as like um, um, hackers, or these uh, kind of uh, cyber threats that are coming, coming to you. Um, and eventually, the, the part of the big story in Game of Thrones is that you have a very big wall. And the entire, you know, during all the season of the, 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 the TV show that focuses on the wall. I mean, we have this wall, we are going to protect the wall, they can't break the wall, etc., etc. But the problem with walls, and put politics aside, you know, I'm coming from Israel as well, so it's uh, dangerous. Uh, but the problem with walls in general, that eventually uh, walls break, eventually, and this is, a, this is a military methodology about eventually the defense line breaks, always. Can maybe take a year, 10 years, a thousand years. But eventually the defense line breaks. And then the question, and the same in cybersecurity, if we think about cybersecurity, is just protecting our entity just building bigger walls and bigger walls and bigger walls without taking into, into consideration all the different aspects of proactive security, then we are missing the, uh, the big picture. Because when we talk about cybersecurity today, it's, it's important to understand that we're not talking about you know, this one attack every few weeks that you may hear about in the news. We're talking actually about tens of millions of attacks on a daily basis. So many of them are unknown to you. Many of them are not you know, causing a lot of damage. Some remain uh, very silent for a long time because their purpose is not to create the direct damage, but actually to stay in your system and collect data, what we call like APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, and we'll get to that. And you know, as we invest more and more efforts and more money in cybersecurity, still the number of attacks and the average cost of a specific attack are on the rise, and if we look specifically on the cost of cyber crimes, just last year, 
we are talking about almost $700 billion last year, costs worldwide of these crimes related to uh, ransomware attacks, to damage, reputation damage, etc. We'll get to that. Uh, and the expectation is that it's going to grow, to grow to one trillion in two years, and then probably two trillion in two to three years. And the question, it's not going to, it's important to understand, it's not, it's not going to stop. And then the question is, when we look at our entities, our institutions, it's A, um, you know, sometimes you don't need to outrun the, the bear, just outrun the others. Um, so first, you don't want to be the weakest link, and we want to make sure that at least our institutions are not there, are not becoming these weakest links. And also, uh, if this is, uh, you know, if this is the, I don't want to call it necessary evil, but if this is going to happen anyway at some, some point, so we have to make sure that we did our best to prevent it, uh, also because for insurance reasons, regulation reasons, customer reputation, a lot of issues, and also once it happens that we can respond to it uh, you know, in, in a fast and, and efficient and efficient way. And specifically, when we look at the main targets of cyber attacks, about almost 30% of cyber attacks are targeting financial institutions from big to small, um, because uh, of course, a lot of um, money, data, um, and low security a lot of times are uh, related to these kind of usage. So let me dive into the specifics of this, um, of this uh, presentation. So I said, we're not just going to talk about walls. So let's put walls aside. In, this, in our context, walls is firewalls, antivirus, these uh, detectors, etc. These are, okay, obvious. Great, you have them, hopefully, okay? But let's talk about other things when we think about cybersecurity. So the first thing is, um, and this is again from the analogy of Game of Thrones, let, let's look at the things from the enemy perspective, okay? And to explain that, let's take a story. All the examples will be, of course, real stories. And let's take a story that happened last year, actually really a year ago, May 2018. Um, Canadian Bank, um, I think it was Bank of Montreal, yeah. Bank of Montreal, another bank, uh, on May 28th, 2018, they received a ransom note, not a ransomware, just a note from a hacker saying, hey, we stole 90,000 uh, pieces of data uh, of your customers, like bank accounts, customer data, whatever. Uh, we can give it back to you, but you need to pay us a million dollars. Um, the bank decided not to pay, it went out, was, you know, got published, the bank got hit, not just from the 90,000 pieces of data that were exposed, but also reputation, uh, regulators, all the issues about this kind of um, data breach. But you know, when we hear about 90,000 customer, uh, customers' data stolen, what does it mean actually? I mean, where is it? Who stole it? I mean, how does it look like from the enemy perspective, you know, from the territory that is out there in the woods of the White Walkers? And I want you to first take a look at how it looks from the enemy side. So when we think about data breaches in general, which is one of the biggest um, damages of cyber crimes in general, um, in 2009, 2010, 2010, um, this was the space of data breaches, mostly uh, small data breaches. The biggest one was like 100 and something million um, uh, accounts without a lot of damage. And then when we look at uh, 18, 17, 18, 19, we see bigger breaches with much more effect. You know, every fax, of course, but Marriott recently, Facebook, Google. I mean, Google Plus. Google decided to close this um, Google Plus operation. I mean, it was not good anyway. But uh, one of the reasons was that just to close all the security issues, you know, and patches, they would need to invest tons of money, which just doesn't make sense with Google Plus. They just shut it down, shut the entire project down because they had this breach. So um, we see these breaches affecting a lot of companies. But when we see this breach, like, okay, 90,000 users are stolen, where is it? So if I'm a hacker and I stole 90,000 users, or I stole your uh, company's data, your customer's data, your portfolio company's IP, doesn't matter, I have your assets now. Now I have an asset, and, and you know about assets more than I do, I wanna, I wanna make this, I wanna trade with this asset. I wanna turn this asset into money. I wanna liquidate this, uh, this asset. So, I mean, I can use it. If this is just money, I can use it. For example, I can take uh, money from accounts, buy, I don't know, Bitcoin, or convert it to something else, laundry, like do the quick money laundering thing and use the money. But it's kind of a problem when you have 90,000 accounts, or 900,000 accounts, or if I just have secrets of your company. I mean, I, don't, I, I can't use them, 
the secrets, and you can sell them. I mean, maybe somebody's willing to pay millions of dollars uh, for these specific secrets, and I can't just you know post it on Facebook. So we're so the the way to do that is to go to these what we call dark web marketplaces. So just to explain, when we when we say dark web, it's just a terminology that means that there is a place in the internet. It's the same internet. Okay, it's not like different, totally different. But there is a place in the internet, uh, which is um, to get access to. You probably need a specific proxy or a different browser, or you go through different type of encryption. But it doesn't require much technology. Just that you can download a browser, like a browser that's called Tor browser, and with this browser you can get access to these marketplaces. So this is an example of a marketplace, it's called Alphabay. It's, it doesn't exist anymore, I'll show you marketplaces that do exist. This was one of the most popular marketplaces on the dark web um, between 2014 to 2017, when it was um, seized by the FBI. So three years this marketplace was active, and what, what is interesting is that while it was active, is if you can see the categories, the ca categories here are different than the Amazon thing, right? So we, we have like fraud, Drugs, um, counterfeit items, etc. So if I click fraud, um, I have different types of fraud. One of them is bank accounts. Okay. So if I stole bank accounts of Bank of Montreal or uh, Wells Fargo, for example, uh, then I want to sell them. So if I have now an account users with let's say ten thousand dollars on average, one thousand of them. So this asset potentially worth ten million dollars. Now I need to sell it so people will pay less. I mean, if I'm buying $10,000 or potential of getting $10,000, I'm willing to pay $1,000 for it because there is a risk related to it, etc. So I'm uploading it to this marketplace and then it's available for people to trade. So if I click on the Wells Fargo one, so I see this is from 2017. I didn't want to take through you know, a lot of fresh examples, but it's always there. Um, so you, know, you have a new batch, the hacker or like a third party vendor that works with the hacker, upload the data there. This data, this time it's bank accounts. It can be IP, like, or, you know, patents that's still an in process, or other customer data, or legal documents, or whatever. Whatever that has value to someone. So if it has value to someone, someone is willing to pay for it. This is the easiest thing to understand because if, if I have an account with $10,000, somebody is willing to pay $1,000 to get access to this account. And if this account doesn't work for some reason, because, I don't know, the bank identified a problem, then you have refund policy. You know, you'll get your money back. I paid $1,000, I didn't get my $10,000 in the account, so I get refunded. And you have vendor trust, uh, vendor level and trust level. So this, this is actually, because we're financial professionals, um, this is actually a, a market, you know, a marketplace. Um, it has its own rules. Um, and even if I'm a thief or a hacker, I still want to be a trustworthy thief and because I want people to trade with me. So this is the way these things work um, you know, on, on these marketplaces. And you can see like uh, customer feedback, like will purchase again, highly recommended, uh, uh, you know, uh, things like that. And it's interesting because what happens is, uh, is that you, know, you have the big fish. You have this, let's say, hacker or hacking group or group of criminals. But potentially, if I'm just a random guy here from New York, you know, I'm not a criminal, I don't consider myself a criminal, but I know I heard about this place that I can go pay 1,000, get 10,000, you know? Nobody will ever, I mean, the chances of me getting caught, like the FBI is putting effort in catching me, are really, really, you know, the, the risk is really low, because, uh, I mean, there are thousands of people doing that. Even if the FBI or some other law enforcement agency will find me, well, I stole an account, or I actually acquired, I didn't, I didn't hack in, into anyone. I acquired an account that is stolen. Yeah, it's, it's illegal, but okay. And I don't know who's the hacker, and I can't tell you who's the hacker because I don't know. I bought it in this uh, you know, encrypted marketplace where I don't know, you know. So, I mean, worst case, I mean, yeah, you can catch me, maybe. Also, it's super difficult to find me because I'm also going through this encryption line. So you're investing millions of dollars to catch someone that eventually stole $1,000 or $10,000 and doesn't know anything about the big scheme, doesn't help, you know, doesn't help. So it takes time and a lot of effort and what we call avatars and the, the, these fake identities that we get into the marketplaces. 
um, and they get to the traders and they are looking for mistakes of traders. So yeah, eventually this specific marketplace has been seized, Alphabay. Uh, like other marketplaces in the past, like Silk Road was a very famous marketplace for drugs, has been seized as well. But we still have other marketplaces active, like this one from 2013. This one's six years now working um, and still active and billions of dollars of transactions are in this marketplace. So people are making a lot of money and a lot of people, I mean, uh, vendors and the managers of the website. That, so it's, it's like a marketplace, online marketplace that is super active. Dream Market is one of them. Another one is Wall Street Market. Um, and we have other markets and I'm just you know, gonna, gonna skip that. Uh, and and you know, if we go on to the dark web, it's not just about marketplaces. The, mar the dark web also offers us, um, I mean, let's think about a marketplace as a place where you can get or buy products. So as in the regular market, I can buy products or I can buy services. So the products are like accounts or data or IP, uh, where services are like hacking services. So for example, I may want to cause damage or I may want to have a specific need that is not available on the marketplace right now. So I want to ask someone with the skills to provide me that. For example, steal data from this company's email or hack into your phone. Um, or for example, um, uh, even change grades on, on, on universities or whatever I need, you know, uh, whatever I need or to cause damage. Like um, sometimes I don't want data or don't want money. I, did, I just want to cause you damage. For example, I'm a competition and I'm a, let's say I'm not an American company. I'm somewhere in another country. I don't know. I mean, even American companies do that. But uh, let's say some evil company out of country that just want to cause damage. Um, and I can do it myself. I don't have the resources, but I have the money. Um, so I pay someone to do like a DDoS, like denial of, distributed denial of service attack. Like I'm going to attack your company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the dark web allows us a lot of uh, different, you know, products and services. So when you hear about this data was stolen, this IP was stolen, this is. Uh, you know, this was compromised, we need to understand that a lot of the, these things are actually going into the dark web. Now, just to put this in the context, you know, what actually I want to say, okay, that's great. What do you want to say? So what the, the thing I want to say is, and go back to the story about the Bank of Montreal. So the question with the Bank of Montreal is, okay, on May 28th, 2018, the bank got this ransom note that we have 90,000 accounts, pay us $1 million. But the big question in my point of view is, when did it happen? Okay, when did it happen? Because the bank didn't know until the, the hackers told them, told them. And if we go back and we do, we use something, this is one of the things I wanted to say, when we think about cybersecurity, a big part of it is what we call threat intelligence. So the first thing I wanted to talk with you about it is threat intelligence. Threat intelligence, like intelligence in general, you know, the purpose of intelligence, there are many different purposes of doing intelligence from a military perspective. But the first and foremost important thing that you do in intelligence is to prevent the attack. And while the attack is happening, to understand what's going on and later to do attribution, you know, who did that, why, and then how do I prevent the next attack. So these are things that when we think about cybersecurity, what I see a lot of security teams, they focus on the wall, you know, about the security part and not asking necessarily the right questions or doing the right analysis. So the Bank of Montreal, for example, if we were doing an investigation on the dark web, we could see that on May 11th, 10th and 11th, there was this big, this big peak in transactions with Bank of Montreal accounts. So probably somewhere, like a week before or some time before, this where the data, you know, uh, this was where the data breach happened. But the bank didn't know about it for two and a half weeks. Now there's questions about, you know, how the bank could prevent the damage, liability, the response. I mean, there are a lot of things that even if you couldn't prevent the attack, even to understand that the attack happened, it's another challenge that we have. Now, if we go a few months back, and we don't look just at these, uh, these marketplaces, but we go and investigate um, these um, hacking forums, hackers that are discussing about potential targets that are sharing information about weaknesses and vulnerabilities, we see that around um, November, December of 2017, um, uh, I think, maybe I'm wrong, 
uh, yeah, around December 2017, we saw a lot of discussions among hacking forums to, that, will, that discussed about specific Canadian banks. So potentially the bank could know or could have known that um, somebody is targeting them. Could you prevent the attack or not? That's a different question. But the intelligence important, like the importance of doing, like being an intelligence officer and providing intelligence is first to tell you, look, you are being targeted by these groups, and then you need to start investigating. Okay, these groups usually do, you know, these kind of attacks, these kind of witnesses, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the first thing I wanted to say that when we think about cybersecurity, not only think about the walls, but also think about um, the intelligence. So uh, again, going back to Game of Thrones, and sorry for those of you who are not uh, watching or not, fan, not fans, but um, this is in the Game of Thrones. You have this uh, uh, castle, um, Winterfell. Uh, this castle, um, again, when we talked about cyber intelligence, when you talk about the walls, it's, you understand what I mean. But when you talk about cyber intelligence, it's what happens beyond this picture, what happens in the, the enemy's camp. Now the next question I'm asking myself is about uh, the front door, because a lot of times we put a lot of you know, emphasis on protecting the walls, building stronger walls, but the question is, what about the front door? You know, what's coming in, uh, what's coming in from the front door? That's a real Trojan horse in Tel Aviv University. Um, and one of the things that we think about the front door is what we call spear phishing. So you've probably heard about phishing, and you know phishing, and, every, and this is where, where it makes, where, where it gets like, uh, don't click, don't download, don't, all, all the do's and don'ts. But I think that we need to understand that phishing, or front door access, you know, uh, became, become, and uh, there is a reason why I'm showing this, uh, became really um, different than what it was before. And to demonstrate it, I'd say, let's say I wanna hack one of you, okay? And I'm not, not talking about sophisticated hacking, nothing, front door, you're gonna get me in, okay? Um, so, for example, I know that there is this event, I mean, it was published, I mean, it's, it's, it's public information. I'm going to the website of this event, I see these sponsors. So I know that they're either here or communicating with the people, and I didn't, by the way, I didn't tell Opus Connect that I'm gonna do that, so I'm, again, it's just a demonstration, I didn't do anything. Um, but, for example, you take these companies, and um, then, um, I mean, I, let's say I don't know nothing about Opus Connect, not, nothing about, I'm just random, I chose this event to attack um, uh, companies that participate in this event. So I'm going to another tool that is available, everything is free online, I'm just looking at emails of people that work for Opus Connect. So I see names, I see uh, accounts, etc. Now I like the, the word Opus Connect because O and zero, they look really similar. So I go online um, and I buy a new domain, okay? I buy a domain Opus Connect, just instead of O, I'm buying it with zero, or Opus Connect with O, just with not double N, just one N. I buy one of these accounts, it cost me $12, okay? And then I uh, call one of these accounts, Lou at Siding Connect, or someone else at Siding Connect, uh, at the Opus Connect, sorry. Um, and uh, I have the pictures from, from the website and LinkedIn or whatever. And I am, uh, and then I also have the names of the companies that you know are sponsoring and will probably respond, reply, communicate with somebody sending emails from Opus Connect. Now, I mean, let's say I chose Lou, um, and then I'm going to another tool online, and I'm looking at Lou's connections. Again, this is all free tools online. Just looking at some companies or people that Lou is working with. And I can even uh, find his phone number and maybe, um, I don't know, back the email I'm sending also with another phone call. Sending, um, you, know, you, know, you understand what I mean. Eventually, the reason I, sh I show that is that a lot of time we think about these phishing attacks as, yeah, this Nigerian prince, if you heard about it, these emails that come from, I don't know, somebody in Nigeria that says, hey, we have $10 million from your dead uncle. Okay, I mean, you will not, well, I mean, you will not be the victims of this. I, I know, by the way, I know people who were victims of this kind of attack. Sorry for them, but, um, but you will not be the victims of this kind of attack. But the question is about phishing and about when we think about front gate attacks is really to think about the sophisticated, I mean, you're interested enough, your entities, the money, the data, I mean, what's interesting in like the lower to middle market financial institutions or entities is that they manage a lot of money, but they're small. So they don't have these 
huge, like hundreds of people, you're not like Citibank, thousands of people doing security, protecting their, probably nobody or some external services, or I don't know what. So you have a lot of money, or you're managing a lot of money, but you're not necessarily up to date with, you know, uh, so you are pr probably an easy target, uh, easier target. Uh, so when we think about, you know, when we think about that, when we think about front gate, um, it means that we have to um, make sure that our teams, for example, be, to do these, uh, actually in this building today there was a fire drill, I mean I'm, my office actually in this building, so we had a fire drill. So there are fire drills from time to time, okay, I mean nobody likes them but it's, it's necessary. And the question is, do people, you know, know how to react in these situations? Um, um, and, and one of the things that are beyond the training and, and, um, and I would say uh, the typical um, fire drill thing is what I call, or we call in the industry, red teaming. You may have heard about the concept of pen testing, which is, I, I want to explain the difference between red teaming and pen testing and why I think it's important uh, that you will consider that in your organizations or companies, etc. And when we think about pen testing or penetration testing, uh, we actually take usually a software or a website or an app, something, and we, te we test its vulnerabilities. We give hackers to play with it and say, find the vulnerabilities. But we actually, in this case, we tell them, it's like, if I'm going to the uh, Winterfell example, you know, it's like telling them, you see this thing? Check if, it's, uh, if, if it can uh, hold uh, an attack. But what about the other things? So when we do pen testing, we actually tell the pen testers, we focus them on a specific, a very specific app or a very specific tool. But red teaming is saying to someone, try to get into my company in any way. I mean, to my, to my networks. Just do whatever you want. I mean, I will provide you the authorization and this is the NDA we sign and this is whatever, I mean, of course. But um, try to get in and find vulnerabilities that maybe are not in the app or in the specific software or in whatever, but maybe the human, you know, human weaknesses. Maybe your uh, front desk is weak, you know, because somebody can go, go into your front desk physically and do something. Maybe you have this problem in the network. Maybe your sales team are so eager to sell, to sell that they click on everything that, I mean, whatever. So, you know, testing something beyond, uh, beyond the, the pen test. Now another thing that, um, that I want to talk about again in the context of Game of Thrones is that let's say you want to protect your kingdom. Uh, so I talk about threat intelligence, I talk about these front gate spear phishing uh, aspects. The next question is what about known vulnerabilities? So let's say this is your castle, I mean that was your castle, Winterfell, and you know that under your castle there are some tunnels. I mean you just found out that there are some tunnels, and there is a way in, there is a back door. You just found out about that. I mean, somebody told you. And the thing is, and I, I, I want to, the example that I have here is what we call CVEs, or Common Vulnerabilities and Exploits. So what happens is if you're using tons of softwares, the software, different, I don't know, Microsoft tools, Google tools, other tools, whatever. Now, from time to time, um, there are specific weaknesses that are being identified in these tools. The cybersecurity uh, companies and the software companies, they identify this vulnerability, and then you get this update. You are required to, to update your system, to, you know, to do the patch or to install the update. But the problem is that uh, once you got a you know, notification that there is this kind of vulnerability, all the hackers are now also aware of the fact that there is a vulnerability because they're tracking this information as much as you do or your security team. So once there is this, we call them, maybe you heard about the, the word zero day attacks. So zero day attacks is an attack that nobody know about. Even, for example, I find a weakness on Microsoft Word, for example, that even Microsoft doesn't know about that. That's a zero day attack. That's a different kind of challenge. These are really usually, uh, I'll get to the zero day attacks, but these are usually the more sophisticated, something that's maybe you can prevent in many ways. But most attacks are the one day attacks, not the zero day. So the vulnerability is now known, it was published, but your security teams or your companies or you didn't do the patch 
or didn't update the system, and now you are vulnerable. By the way, WannaCry, one of the biggest ransomware attacks had ever happened in the world in 2017, was in a um, uh, Microsoft, like Windows XP um, software that the vulnerability was known for months before the WannaCry attack. But millions of institutions didn't make the change or, for example, a lot of times you're just using software that there is no, nobody's keeping updates for security with this software, like old software or old apps or some things in your systems that are just not being, even on your phone, by the way. You may have downloaded an app in the past that you stopped using it and nobody actually is using it. The company is dead or something happened and nobody's doing security patches, but you still have this Trojan horse, so-called, on your system. And this is when you think about yourself, but it's also in a bigger, you know, when we think bigger about our companies and about the software we're using. So managing known vulnerabilities and prioritizing known vulnerabilities is, is also something that, uh, that is highly, highly critical. Now, the next thing I wanna, I wanna talk about, again, sorry I'm jumping between different topics because, um, again, just to give you the context again, security, cybersecurity, not just walls, not just antivirus, not just firewalls, but other measures. We talked about threat intelligence, we talked about these tunnels, these common vulnerabilities that we need to identify. We talked about front gates, phishing and spear phishing. And I wanna talk about um, what we call um, IoT security. So for example, let's say you have a very important meeting going on. You know, uh, you have these board meetings or uh, these um, super confidential me meetings. You don't want anyone to be part of the meeting. The problem is that when we think about our office, is that with time, we have more and more smart devices everywhere. I mean, not just uh, this hand computer, uh, we call a phone, but also, um, and, and computers, but also uh, smart printers that are connected to the network, of course, and cameras, and security cameras, and maybe the air conditioning is connected to your uh, whatever. And the question is, how much attention do we put to what we call IoT security? IoT, Internet of Things. So not just protecting our computers, but protecting our assets. So let's say that this is, that if this were our devices, sorry. So if this was a, a, a very important meeting, um, we wanna make sure that all the devices around are protected. And also once you get into a specific device, from this device you can get to other devices. For example, if the printer is connected to the network, that's connected to the computer network, and the, there is a weakness or a vulnerability in the printer, and I can just reach out directly to the printer, that I can actually get into your network without having to go through all your, all your other defense mechanisms. Um, so just to, to, to demonstrate something, um, so there is a, a search engine called Shodan. Uh, so Shodan is, uh, is a search engine for IoT. So if I'm searching Google for, if I'm Googling for information about, I don't know, just data or information or uh, pictures or whatever, I will search here on Shodan for IoT devices or just devices. For example, I can search for a type of security camera um, and then find security cameras that are connected uh, right now to the network. Now the thing with security camera, and maybe you heard about that with your router, etc., is that a lot of time you install a security camera, it's on your network, but there is like a backdoor access to the security camera. And to every device, there is this default password and the default user that you can use. Uh, and the, the thing is that about, I would say 50%, that's not my research, but about 50% they don't change the default. Um, just because they don't even aware of the default. It's like, you know your Wi-Fi password, but do you know your router password? Not the Wi-Fi password, like, because I can reach out directly to the router and configure the router. But the router has a password, it's probably it's admin admin. Or you, you can check. Uh, so, for example, the, uh, the camera example, I can just, Choose a camera, not in the U.S., and um, and uh, do admin admin, and then get access to uh, security cameras, for example. And uh, when we think about different devices, security cameras like the uh, this is an example I've been using for a long time now. But this is actually the old example. I mean, today there are so many different devices I don't have to go directly to the security camera. So another thing that we consider security again, not just the walls, but also all the devices. We need to understand what what are the devices we have, and how we, um, 
you know, map the devices and how we make sure that we manage the vulnerabilities of these devices. Now, I talked about zero uh, one-day attacks, and I start to talk about zero-day attacks. So a zero-day attack is a big problem. The problem, the problem is that um, zero-day attack, just to explain, it means that I am investing, or not me, somebody is investing a lot of money and effort to identify and to find a new vulnerability that nobody knows about. It means that not even Microsoft knows about this uh, vulnerability. It means that this vulnerability, when I know about it, it's worth millions. Because, it, just as a vulnerability, I can sell the vulnerability. So there is a market, by the way, secondary market, just for selling vulnerabilities, what we call zero-day attacks. So probably you won't be targeted, or just you, with a zero-day attack directly. I mean, because they may not spend it on you. So a lot of governments and um, well-funded hacking teams, let's call them, like government-led hacking teams, etc., they are focusing on finding these zero-day vulnerabilities and attack based on these zero-day vulnerabilities. And, and when we look today at um, the US you know, intelligence reports, etc., they top these cyber attacks as you know, top of the list in, in threats. And these threats, again, they also focus on the industry, not just on critical infrastructure, etc. So when we think about, um, and I want to give you an example of, of these kind of attacks and the challenge of what we call attribution in this attack. So uh, I'll tell you another story. In uh, May 2017, sorry, I started to talk about this uh, WannaCry attack. I don't know if you heard, if you remember, 2017 WannaCry attack, big ransomware attack, millions of computers around the world are locked down, uh, including uh, hospitals, transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. May 2017. Two months later, there was another ransomware attack. Or at least we thought it's another ransomware. It looked really similar to a ransomware attack. Uh, encryption of computers, you ask to pay money, like a ransom in Bitcoin to get your data back. Okay, seems the same. But when you paid the ransom to the hacking group, you didn't get your data back. You got a key to decrypt the data, but the key didn't match. And it may, may sound okay, but okay. So, um, when we talk about ransomware, hackers will provide your data back, actually, because it's a business. I mean, you pay them in Bitcoin, they give you the data back, so you can tell others, oh, they give you the data back, pay the ransom. Uh, I mean, they, they don't have any interest to cause you necessarily damage, they just want the money. So a case where you pay the ransom and don't get your data back, it's a rare case. It's, it's something that we used to call, it, uh, we used to call it wiper, like wipe out the data, and not ransomware. And then, in this case, one of the challenges we have in cybersecurity is attribution. Who did that and why? why? Why am I targeted? And in this case, again, going back to investigations or what they call like, you know, forensics in cybersecurity, and this is another aspect of cybersecurity, is asking who is responsible. Now, for example, to ask who is responsible, the first question I would ask is, where was patient zero? And what, where were most of the victims? So if I go and I see the wiper attack, I see that patient zero and most of the victims, more than 75% of the victims, were in Ukraine. And when I look at the other victims, most of them were around Ukraine or with uh, countries, companies, that have a lot of uh, trade with Ukraine. And if I have this context, and I know the bigger context of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, uh, then I would say that, um, Probably the, the first suspect would be the Russians. Now here I have to I have to um, I have to be careful because everyone knows that the Russians are doing bad stuff in cyber. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Okay, everyone knows it's like common knowledge. So if I'm trying to attack someone and I want to disguise my attack, like I'm the Iranian Iranians and I'm I'm attacking Israel now, I want to make it look like it's the Russians for different reasons. Like in this case, most, by the way, most intelligence agencies in this attack agree it's the Russians. But a lot of times when we are trying to understand attribution, we need to understand that these hacking groups are sophisticated and they know, they know what we do around, <coughs> this is going to go here, um, they know and they are using, you know, they are developing new tools on cyber warfare. So eventually, um, and they're going to test them. For example, the Russians, their main threat vector is not the Ukrainians. 
I mean, they're in conflict with Ukraine, but they don't really care about Ukraine in the bigger context. So United States, maybe, okay? I mean, that's probably a bigger example. So testing cyber tools in Ukraine makes sense for Russia to, you know, to like, like again, not getting into politics, like testing bombs in Afghanistan. Like testing, like that's not our main threat vector, but we need to test this weapon, and we're gonna test it in this, you know, battle zone, and then we can use it in other places. So when we think about um, cybersecurity, again, a, another challenge of cybersecurity is actually forensic teams and how we analyze, you know, who attacked us, malware analysis, what was the type of malware, because sometimes we think we got it covered. I mean, the attack, okay, the attack now is over, we're good, but actually we have maybe in our system something that is called APT, like Advanced Persistent Threat. And um, understanding, you know, APT is something that's hard to detect, it's advanced, and hard to remove, it's persistent, and it po poses a lot of threat because it can either collect information about your business where you don't know about that, or it can at some point shut down the, the network or cause some other damage, again, just by deciding it's gonna do. Um, so the next thing, when we think about cybersecurity. So we talked about the walls and the front gate, and we talked about the devices and APT, et cetera, et cetera. Now the next question is, let's say an attack is, in, like, you can't prevent. Let's say there's an attack, it's going to happen. There's gonna be a war where your war, so-called, where your business is going to be attacked. Then the question actually moves from prevention and detection, maybe, into remediation, recovery, incident response. Another thing that is really important when we think about cybersecurity is having um, the right incident response in place. And I'll take a story from another entity without getting into names here because that was kind of not known for everyone. Uh, so let's say there is a financial institution, a bank in this case. Uh, this bank has ATMs in New York City. Uh, it, it didn't happen in New York City, but for the example. Uh, in New York City, and sometimes in, in the morning, all the ATMs stop working. So at first, like the IT get involved, they think, okay, there's an IT problem, it seems like it's not an IT problem, because like 30 minutes later, their computers in some of their branches in the city, um, they get encrypted, like the data is encrypted, and they get this, this is a real example from a specific ransomware. Uh, you see, it's a very, the, the, the hackers want to explain what happened, so you can pay. Uh, how to decrypt, pay this in Bitcoin, to there, contact us by email, we'll help you get your data back, just pay us the ransom. So we understand that this bank is under attack. Uh, then later this information, customer information was breached, and then the bank confirms that they had a data breach, the stock, and you know the drill. And the question is, is this the IT or security team responsibility? And what I, what I claim, or what I want to say, is that a, an incident response, a cyber incident response, is a business case and not a technical case. Yet there are technical aspects for that, like um, technical recovery, understanding maybe what happened. But we have many other things. For example, how to keep business continuity. Uh, we have uh, issues like legal issues um, from uh, you know, lawsuits, insurance. We have regulation and fines. Uh, reputation and, and, and a lot of big damage that we see in cyber attacks and in incident response is the company not reacting correctly with customers. For example, if a big thing happened and the company said, well, nothing big happened. So, and then like a few hours later, we understand that it's a big crisis and then the company's actually, the biggest damage for the company is the reputation. Because we thought about cybersecurity as a technical thing, we had our technical teams ready but our marketing team, PR, legal team, they don't know. So they just, they don't know what the drill is. So we, we create, there's a lot of damage coming from, uh, from that side. So incident response is another really important thing when we think about cybersecurity. It's not, when we think about cybersecurity as protection, detection, remediation, then again, we need to understand, sometimes we cannot prevent the attack. Some, we can prevent crime, for example. I mean, crime will happen. Crime will happen, 
people will steal money from us, people will do that, breaking it. I mean, things like this will happen. We want to minimize that. We don't want to be the victims. We want to make sure we detect once it happens. So that's all the pre-attack or during attack. But even after attack, okay, it happened. Now what? And I see a lot of companies that they focus on the protection side, but eventually when an event happens, they don't have um, all the you know all the pieces are not in place. By the way, I also see it with, with governments, including the Israeli government in the past, not just in cybersecurity. I mean, when you have a an attack, it doesn't matter if it's a cyber attack or a physical attack or like a missile attack. Uh, you have to make sure that all the different elements, all the different pieces, know what to do when there is an attack. So this is when we think about cyber. Uh, the incident response part is also very good. Now, I also want to talk another aspect of cybersecurity is the regulator. So, uh, when we think about cybersecurity, again, not just as a technical thing, um, then even if we did everything, you know, um, we did the protection, detection, remediation, we made sure the walls are good, the, the front door is good, we have this IoT devices patched, we have everything. The question is, did we follow, did we, were, were we in compliance with the regulator? And you may think, okay, I mean, we'll get a fine or whatever, but uh, we need to understand how the regulation is working right now. For example, when we think about the GDPR. So the GDPR, um, the data protection regulation in Europe, for example. For example, for every company that has clients in Europe, which is almost every US company, medium-sized US company, I don't know. Um, for every company that has clients in Europe, you have to be GDPR compliant. Now, part of being GDPR compliant, not just about, okay, about how do you protect the data, et cetera, but there are a lot of different things or different aspects. For example, do your com does your company have a DPO, like this data protection officer? The GDPR required to have a DPO. Now, these can be small things that eventually when something happens, the biggest problem you have will be this thing, because part of the problem with GDPR, and we see that with um, uh, Facebook and Google are now facing lawsuits that may, may win, but we need to understand that this can be up to uh, either 20 million euros or, that's a bigger problem, 4% of the annual revenue worldwide. 4% of the annual revenue worldwide can be defined. And this is what uh, we are talking about this I don't remember, it's five or six or four billion dollars potential fine now against Facebook in Europe with the data analytics um, crisis they had. Because some of it was European data. And these are things that eventually can cause, of course, tremendous financial damage. And these can be the biggest, the, this can be the biggest problem we have. That's why when we think about compliance officers, when we think about regulation, we think this is not that the CISO will not help you in this case, and n n neither the, the, the IT teams. The question is how your compliance team, your regulation team are aware of all the different is issues. And not just Europe, by the way. Here in, in New York, okay, the uh, NYDFS, it's about the cybersecurity regulation for financial institutions. So these are the type of financial institutions that are um, you know, under this regulation. There are different aspects that you need to cover in this regulation. Um, I won't get into that right now, but these are different aspects. Last thing, um, and uh, I know it's getting late. Um, last thing that I wanted to talk about when I think about cybersecurity is, okay, you did everything. Okay, you have the walls ready. You have the security team, your I IoT, your front gate, your tunnels, everything is ready. But now you've decided that you are acquiring a new team, a new company. You are merging with a new company. You are buying a new, acquiring a new company. You have a third party vendor who has strategic access to your data. In this case, I give this wild link, but these people coming to your, to your space. Now, what about them? You are great, okay, you are great, but what about these third party vendors or you just decided to acquire a new company. And something that I see a lot, and this is about when we think about M&A, that's where I think it's relevant. Because, of course, there is a due diligence process in place, that's great. But as you saw before, a lot of times companies, they don't know that they were victims of cyber crimes. They don't know that their, their data is out there in the dark web. They don't know that their trade secrets, their, their 
business secrets are out there. So in a due diligence process that you do while you're acquiring this company, you won't know about that because they don't know about that. And they can't, you know, they can't provide, reveal this information because they don't aware of this information. And I think, and I see this in, I mentioned, but other than working in cybersecurity, I'm also a lawyer, though in Israel, not here, but, um, and, uh, and I saw a lot of legal cases like this, um, where, not a lot, but several legal cases like this, where, okay, you acquired a company, but then you found out later, months later, that their data, or what you acquired, I'm not, I'm not gonna say useless, but actually exposed, or being traded, or that the company has so many um, issues with cybersecurity, and now it's your issue, because this is your company right now. And the data that they hold of these companies that it was revealed, it's a big problem. That's why one of the things when I think about cybersecurity today is how to combine, let's call it cyber due diligence in the acquisition process of a company. So cyber due diligence means that regardless of what the company revealed, I mean, we can, it can be part of our requirements for the company in the acquisition process, but either ourselves or a third party or some entity will make sure to check this, let's call it the cyber due diligence, to make sure the vulnerabilities of the company, regardless of what the company is revealing or regardless of what the company knows. I'm not saying if the company hide information, that's another thing, okay? And that's another legal issue. But they didn't hide anything. They just, they literally weren't aware of this thing. Like Bank of Montreal, for example. They didn't know. Let's say somebody acquired Bank of Montreal now. And let's say it's not 90,000 accounts, but 9 million accounts. And nobody knew about that. But three months later, now you know about that. Now what? And that's why when we think about, um, you know, M&A or other transactions, uh, we need to ask ourselves, I mean, about the vulnerabilities of the company or entity we're acquiring. Same thing about third-party vendors. I didn't put a lot of emphasis about that, but. By the way, the regulation that I mentioned before uh, for financial institutions specifically mentioned every third party vendor um, that need to be compliant. So for example, going out to, uh, I wanted to give you an example um, about a company from South Africa actually, uh, but this company um, uh, was, they had a, a um, they were going through, a, it was like a half government company going through some acquisition process in South Africa. And apparently later what we find out is that this company suffered a cyber attack, and if you go online to the dark web, you can find a lot of customer information, all their CRM, including customer accounts, including a lot of information about their company was out there. And just by checking the dark web, or, and or, by doing some research online, we can find that this company is like one big breach, so many breaches in this company. You know, data out there, their confidential information, Apparently they had it in some unsecured links so people can access that and um, uh, in, in some other, I, I don't want to get into all these um, tools, but in some other forums and, 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 and groups you have a lot of information about this company, etc, etc, etc. I'm just going to skip all of this because this is all information about the company. Eventually, eventually this is a, this is a, a horrible uh, transaction for everyone because other than what the company does or doesn't do uh, financially, the, this is, a, this is a, a, a time bomb. Like this, this, is, this is ticking uh, when you acquire this kind of uh, asset. Uh, this asset can bring with it uh, so many damage for reputation, regulation, fines, uh, uh, legal issues um, that will be your issues um, and or, or it, it may be a debate, like a legal debate whether whose issue is it, but never mind. But you don't want to you don't want to be in this situation, and the question is, do we even ask these right the right questions? Uh, do we even concern about that, or we say, okay, the due diligence process is just a legal thing. Uh, you know, if they didn't reveal this information, that's their problem, or whatever. I mean, so the, these are questions that I think that in the M&A process we need to uh, consider. Last, really last thing I want to say um, around all of that, um, in my point of view. Still, one of the biggest problems we have around everything, because it, it re it's relevant for the our, um, security teams and the compliance teams and the executives and the people who's doing the transactions and M&A, et cetera, et cetera, is, I mean, is their skills, is their ability, and not just about two things, I, I mean, a lot of times when we talk about skills, I feel like 
people think um, that's what I mean. One, I'm not talking about awareness. The problem with awareness, it's like, and sorry for this example, you know, texting and driving. It's bad? Yeah, we know it's bad. Uh, but a lot of people are doing it anyway because they know it's bad and they, they don't want to do it, but they do it anyway. And okay, you can tell them it's bad. And what? So the problem is that it's not, I think that, you know, leaving things in, in the space of, well, this is not good, this is, yeah, this is it's, it's, not, it's not useful. So when, when I think about um, really relevant, you know, security, ongoing security training, what I have in mind is that every position in the organization get access to, for example, the relevant uh, scenarios, an example of what to do if, and how to do, and what exactly they need to do, not just what don't do this, but actually what they need to do. And not just, you know, general information about cybersecurity, but if I'm a compliance officer, or if I'm doing compliance, regulation, whatever, so I need to be trained on compliance around cybersecurity. It doesn't matter to tell me, to tell me about Wi-Fi security. If, if I'm a security team, I need to make sure I'm aware of all the new things. For, I can be an MIT graduate, super smart, I know everything about technology, but I graduated 10 years ago. So I don't really know what's going on in the cyberspace right now. Who, who needs to tell me I'm not going to school anymore and I may go to the security conference once a year. Okay, so that was a year ago. What happened a month ago? Two months ago, a week ago. So I need to make sure that I'm always up to date with the skills I need and that everyone has the right skills. Even executives, you know, C-suite, uh, um, other executives, managers, it's not, it's not the fun, I mean, I know it's not, it's, a, it's in a way it's a waste of time for you guys. I mean, because, you know, it's not your, you have your own business to do. And I understand, I mean, which is, which is the main business, you know? But um, I think that it, it's just part of the skills. I mean, you have these financial skills, legal skills, and business skills. Have some data skills, okay, cyber skills, let's call it. Uh, even to ask the right questions and to understand what kind of teams you need to operate. Because um, again, if you think the CISO usually will not solve all your problems, because the legal problems, it's not the CISO's responsibility. The PR problem, they don't know about that. I mean, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know a lot of CISOs that, has, you know, that have everything, all the skills in the world. So for us as executives, you know, created this, I'm um, just gonna skip this, creating this you know, hands-on platforms that provide people the relevant um, data, and also expose them to the relevant tools. A lot of th things that I see is, that a lot of businesses, you know, there are so many technologies out there in cybersecurity, and we don't know what's good, what's not, what's valid. I mean, so in my point of view, one of the critical component in training is to make sure that in the training you have different technologies, not necessarily, sorry, not necessarily technologies you're using now, but you can taste different technologies and say, okay, this is, so the CISO will come and say, okay, this is the technology I need for, or the compliance will say, this is a very good GDPR tool that can manage our assets and identify, or this is, because otherwise it's really hard to understand what you need to, um, what you need to acquire. Um, I think I'll stop here, because it's kind of getting late, and if you have any questions or comments, general questions, please, and if not, I'm here. I, going back to the very beginning, back to the dark web and all that, mm -hmm. what does it entail for FBI to actually shut down a website? I mean, of the, you know, of some right. sort or whatever it is. We need to understand that these are, so the, when we think about the dark web, think about um, like a specific network that is encrypted. So you have all these different, um, let's call it routers, this, the data is going from, so it's not even in the US, I mean a lot of it is not in the US. It's so for them, the it's, it's, um, it's not just um, like a dark web, a typical dark web website will not be like, I don't know, abc.com. It will be something a, like abcde.onion, for example. They have a different, a different suffix and, and it's, it's like, it's in the internet, but it's like a separate network in the internet. And to shut it down, I mean you create these hackers, they create these mirror website, they like duplicate, replicate the website in so many, you can't just shut it down. It's really difficult to, uh, and you shut it down, then it pop up like again, that the, it's not like URLs when they shut down a known website. The URL is just a gibberish, like just the letters and digits, dot onion, and tomorrow it will be just a different, and everyone will know about that. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really difficult to shut it down, 
And the focus on shutting it down is to find the person, the identity behind the website. And that's the challenge. Once you find the identity, yeah, you get them locked down, but it can take years um, and they can make billions before, you know? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.